Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We're going to jump back into part two of the lecture. Uh, we talked about the unity of the biblical message last time, and now we're going to talk about uh, study tools, uh, more specifically tools for understanding the message of the Bible. And a lot of these tools, I think, are maybe more particularly helpful even for the historic and literary context. And uh, two years ago when we did the class, I actually put this particular part of the lesson um, I, I attached it to the lesson on literary and historic context, but for the sake of time, I thought it would be better if it had its own spot and that the historic and literary context had their own spots as well. So um, this is why we're doing it this way. And tools for understanding the message of the Bible. There's lots of different uh, tools. And when we were talking about the historical context and the literary context, I'm sure at least uh, this thought was going through your mind a little bit. How do I know the historical context? Because the Bible, it's not just going to always offer up all of those historical points of information. Um, in fact, oftentimes it almost assumes the reader knows some of those historic pieces of information. And then where do I go to learn more about literary aspects of the Bible, different genres, and how we're to understand prophecy as opposed to poetry or gospel or narrative. Uh, well, there are a lot of biblical tools out there to help you. And um, again, you probably know by now that I'm not the kind of person who's going to say, all you need is the Bible and the Bible is all you need and you'll be perfectly fine. The reality is every time you pick up the Bible, again, as we mentioned in lesson one, you become an interpreter. You're relying on some level of knowledge in your mind and hopefully the help of the Holy Spirit to guide you. But as a Christian, you're also relying on all of the Bible teachers that have gone before you. Anyone who's ever helped you, the church, and if you've done any historical digging, you are relying on the historical church, men and women who have gone on generations before you to help you, whether you know it or not, to help you know your theology. So... You are not an island to yourself when you're interpreting. You are standing on the shoulders of many men and women who have been helpful in the church in guiding you and, and understanding the Bible. So, all of that said, to say these tools are also part of that collection of church um, help. The church over generations helping Christians understand the truth of God's word. The collective body of God's people contributing to our knowledge of God and His Word. So what I'm going to do is go through some of these tools in hard copy form, and then I'm also going to show you up on the screen uh, some of the Bible software that I like to use. There's all sorts of different Bible software out there, but I have one that I particularly enjoy, and so I'll get to that after a while. But uh, I have a lot of the, um, the tools in my library, uh, some of which I don't really use a whole lot anymore because I have most of them all electronically now anyway. So it's all right there in my computer, right in front of me. But I will show you for the sake of example what these um, Bible study tools look like. And the first one, I hope, is the most obvious. In your notes there, I have a good translation. A good translation of the Bible. What do I mean by a good translation? Well, there are dozens and dozens of English translations of the Bible. And I'll stick to English translations for the sake that that's probably, I'm guessing, all of our first language, and so it's probably going to be the, the translation of the Bible we choose, an English translation of some kind. Uh, there are many other language translations out there too, meaning that there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of Bible translations. What do I mean by Bible translation? Why don't I just say the Bible? Well, we mean Bible translation because the English Bibles that we have in our hands are not the original copies, right? I think that's probably fairly easy to see and straightforward. You do not hold in your hand an English or Hebrew Bible, um, unless you brought that, <laughs> in, in which case, wonderful. But even that Bible is, in some way, shape, or form, a translation of something even deeper into the past. And so your Bible, my Bible, the English Bible that I use on a regular basis, is a translation of God's Word. God's Word was originally written Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. Um, there's some really interesting little twists to that understanding as well. Um, when you start to think about how the, the Bible was originally spoken and written, um, for instance, 
What language did Jesus likely speak in? Aramaic. What are all four Gospels written in? Greek. That means that the Gospel writers, who are all Aramaic-speaking people, and Greek was likely their second or third language, they wrote the words of Jesus, which were Aramaic, in Greek. They didn't write word for word what Jesus spoke. Think about that. It's incredible when you start to realize how so many Christians in our world are so, can be so hyper-literalistic about the words in the Bible. If they feel if any little jot or tittle is off, that reveals an error in God's word. Well, it doesn't. I can guarantee you the Sermon on the Mount is not written word for word what Jesus spoke. The reason I know that is because Jesus likely preached it in Aramaic, and it's recorded for us in all four Gospels in Greek. There is no perfect one-for-one word equivalency in any language, meaning when you go from one language to the next, there is no perfect dictionary equivalent, not for every word. And so there's going to be a difference. That means the Gospel writers, when they heard Jesus' words, they made choices about what words to write under the inspiration of the Spirit, of course, that God intended these choices to be made the way they were. I say all that to point to the complexity of translations. When you have an English translation in your hands, and you're reading the Gospel of John, you are reading a translation of the Greek. And those writers who wrote it, or that writer who wrote it in Greek, was translating himself from Aramaic. So you're reading a translation that's at least two steps removed from the original message it was spoken in. If they're recording, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. The translations are uh, copies. Exactly that. Translations of the original language. And so we use different ones, um, and there are different popular ones in our day and age, of course. I personally like using the ESV, the English Standard Version. Another really, really good one out there is the New International Version. A lot of people also like the New American Standard Bible, the New Living Translation, and of course, the classic King James Version. All of these, though, are English translations. There are no English Bibles that represent a perfect, word-for-word equivalent of the original language. They simply do not exist. If you know anything about language, they cannot exist because language is as much an art as it is a science. And language changes not just from one generation to the next, but even from you know, the span of even 10 years or so it can change. Think about how much it could change over 1,500 years when we talked about the age and the length of the Bible in the past lesson. So what I, when I, what I mean by a good translation is a translation of God's Word that is going to accurately represent what was expressed in the original language. Now, the reading that I'm going to give you for this week, um, it happens to be another chapter on good translations of the Bible. Not by Gordon Fee from How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, but, um, but by the guys who wrote Grasping God's Word. And so you're going to see kind of their perspective as well. It's very similar to Fee's, of course. But you're going to see their perspective. But they go a little bit more academic, I think, than Fee does. And they kind of trace some of the background of where translations come from and how a translation is made to begin with. So if you like that kind of detailed stuff, uh, that's a really good chapter for you. If you don't like that kind of academic stuff, it's going to be a little bit of suffering to read through that. But I, I guarantee you it will be helpful at some level. It'll be helpful to see where our English translations come from, and why I make such statements like, I like the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, the NLT, or the, or the King James Version, why we can say some of those translations are really, really good and helpful, because they accurately represent the original language um, through a committee of scholars who are trained in their field, who are using information that's been handed down to them through other forms of scholarship, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. They're not just resting on one person's thought or idea. They're resting on the body of the church, 
that kind of goes before them in a committee of, of scholars and translators, all experts in original languages and biblical studies. So good suggestions I would, I would um, submit to you would be the ESV, NIV, NASB, NLT, and KJV. I, put a little ask, I would put a little asterisk by the KJV and simply say, the only situation in which I would ever recommend the KJV to anyone today would be if that was the version you grew up with and it's just literally the most comfortable one for you. Because the reality is, as I'm sure you've already read in Gordon Fee, the KJV actually falls behind many of the modern translations today with regard to accuracy. Um, now that doesn't mean that the KJV is not the true revelation of God's Word. It simply means it's not as accurate as other translations. And I know that might sound like a contradiction. Well, if it's not as accurate, it must not be the true Word of God. It must be corrupted in some way, but it's not. It would be like if I said to you, um, I want you to go build a house, and, I, and, and you're going to go build this house, and I want you to build it using the ancient measurement tools and, and things like the cubic. You've got to build this house using measurements of cubits and spans, you know, like in the Bible, a hand span, and a cubit was the length from your elbow up to your hand. You've got to build that house, and if I gave you all the dimensions and the tools necessary, you go out and you build probably a fairly accurate house to my specifications, right? Okay? But now, if I gave you modern tools that were much more accurate than a hand span or a cubit, I gave, you, um, I gave you tape measures, I gave you levels, um, professional you know, wood planing tools, uh, modern carpentry tools and all the such, the technologies we have today, and I gave you very precise measurements with those tools and said, go build me this house. You would build the same house, but it would just simply be a more accurate house. Perfectly, or near perfectly, representing what I wanted you to build. Now, if you walked into the house built with ancient measurements, and then you stepped out and walked into the house built with modern measurements, you would say, these are both houses. They both accomplish exactly what they were meant to accomplish, but one fits the measurements more accurately. That's what I mean, or at least hopefully that illustration helps when I talk about accuracy, or when you hear scholars talking about accuracy with regard to English translations. The King James Version, the house is built, and the purpose is clear. The message of the gospel is, of course, there. The plan of salvation is easily read and seen in the King James Bible. But the measurements, because we have better research tools at our disposal today, we have a measuring system that helps us understand language better. And so we can produce more accurate reproductions of the original language with some of these other versions like the ESV, NIV, NASB, and the NLT, and, and others like those. And so what I would say is, number one, you need to find a translation that is readable, and two, you need to find a translation that's reputable. If you can do that, then you're going to have in your hands a good quality uh, Bible. And the suggestions that I give to you are similar to what Gordon Fee and Grasping God's Word give as well. Um, but given the scholarship we have on hand today, I believe those are both reputable and readable. Again, I put an asterisk beside the KJV because I wouldn't declare the KJV readable by someone in today's generation. Uh, and that doesn't even have to do with the fact that, you know, well, I'm not trying to say that the previous generations are better readers than, than current generations. Just the reality is the KJV uses language that we don't use in our contemporary world anymore. So you're going to find words that are simply unreadable. They're just not recognizable. And so a readable Bible uh, translation would be one that modern readers can understand. Their words and reproductions of words that actually fit what we experience in everyday life. It's not readable and it's reputable, it's still not going to be helpful to you. If it's readable but not reputable, it's going to be an inaccurate version. So that's why I say it's got to be both. You want to find a Bible that has both, it's both reputable and readable. Uh, I think I, I hope I've given you at least some suggestions there. 
And so that's the first tool, it, just having a good translation of God's Word, the Holy Bible. Um, but then the second tool would just be commentaries. And commentaries come in all shapes and sizes, and um, they are not all created equal either. Uh, I, I, I have a collection of different commentary series that I really like. Most commentaries come in what, what are called series. And so you'll, you'll not just simply find, for instance, the uh, a commentary on Joel and Amos. This isn't like its own standalone book. This comes in an entire series called the Tyndale Old Testament Commentary Series. And so uh, the Tyndale Publishing, um, or sorry, not Tyndale Publishing, but the, but the Tyndale series uh, published by IVP, InterVarsity Press, um, has put together this series. And so they've got a collection of scholars, committee of scholars, and general editors that have put together um, a few dozen of these books to cover the, New, the Old Testament and New Testament. And so the Tyndale Commentary Series is a really good one that I like that covers a span of virtually every book of the Bible, I believe. And a commentary is a book that is essentially going to explain to you and interpret and help you interpret um, verse by verse most of the time the Word of God. So for Joel and Amos here by the Tyndale Commentary, they will literally go through verse by verse with you as you're reading the Word of God. They also have sections specifically for historical context, authorship, who wrote it, um, uh, literary context as well. Most good commentaries will have a whole section at the beginning in the introduction on the different theological themes that you will see throughout this book. So commentaries can be very helpful. Think of it as having not just a pastor, but a scholar and a theologian sitting next to you as you read that particular book and you try to study and understand it. So these commentaries come in all shapes and sizes. What I mean by that is some are more academic and some are more what we would call popular. As a popular writing, we mean a book that is a little bit more geared towards virtually all audiences. And a more popular commentary would be more one like this series, which is the Christ-Centered Exposition Series. And um, this is one that I have on Matthew that um, is written by David Platt, and the editors happen to be David Platt and a few others as well. And in this particular commentary, it's very, very readable. Um, by popular commentary, we oftentimes mean something that's very, very readable and easy to understand. In other words, words that are not as academic as some other ones, that you don't have to be a trained theologian to be able to understand. Um, and so these kind of commentary series can be very, very helpful for just about anyone seeking to go deeper in the Word of God. But if you want to go a little bit deeper than that, again, I would say the uh, Tyndale Commentary series is starting to bridge the gap now between a popular commentary and an academic one. It's not going to be as academic, but it's going to, it's going to start. This is like more maybe, if, if this is more like high school level, um, and that's not to disparage anything or anyone, uh, this is more like college level. You're kind of bridging the gap into something very scholarly. And then I've got a couple here that are even more scholarly. Like this is the Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament. This happens to be the book of Philippians. Now you're going to be getting much more into um, some scholarly things like the original language. As you read through this commentary, you're going to encounter Greek words uh, with explanations of what they mean and things like that. Um, and so you're going to get a little bit deeper into um, the Word of God that way by some of those um, studies. And then you're going to have maybe the, the even more scholarly ones getting maybe further into like graduate school or something like that. Um, much more scholarly. And by that I don't mean better. I just mean um, reaching a different level, a different scholarship level. You're going to be digging into the original language, the history, even deeper. It's going to be talking about ideas and themes that are more complicated, more difficult to understand. So again, that's not necessarily better. Because if you can't understand those academic things, this commentary is useless to you. And then one of these commentaries would be much more better. So by, by scholarly or popular, I don't mean better or worse. I just simply mean written with a different intent and a different author in mind. So There's much more scholarly. And then perhaps some of those scholarly um, commentaries I have are the New International Commentary of the Old Testament and New Testament as well, a series put together over the course of the last three or four decades, incredibly scholarly. And this is the kind of stuff that um, when I open up, you know, you're going to read maybe a page over the course of like half an hour. And you're just going to sit in it and you're going to think about it and you're going to 
you know, link it to the Bible as you're kind of reading through as well. It's, 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 it's deeper stuff, much trickier to, to work through. Uh, so those are some commentaries and some ideas. You're more than welcome to look through them at the end of class as well if you want to kind of just get an idea. Um, background commentaries. Did I put that down in there? Yeah, background commentaries, dictionaries, and other, other good tools as well. So um, I'll bring some of those over. These ones are the intimidating ones. When you go into a pastor's office, you'll see these sitting out, and these are the ones that are, you know, I've really been to school. So this is you know, how thick those are. You know, I had to buy these by the foot. No, so they, they look intimidating, but the reason they're so big, of course, is because just the, the, um, the breadth of information that's in them, like a dictionary, of course. We're talking about, you know, trying to define virtually all the English words in the Bible, providing you with helpful definitions. So this is the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. And so this dictionary is going to be, it's going to cover um, so much information. This one is a much, much more of a word study. It's a series again. It's not its own standalone. It's just volume nine of like 20 different volumes. So it's called the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. And this is a dictionary that's not for the faint of heart because it's a dictionary defining um, Hebrew words. So you kind of have to have at least some understanding of the Hebrew word. And you're going to go and you're going to find it in this dictionary. And then there's going to be an English definition for you of what that, that Hebrew word means. And some scholar has spent a decade researching that one word. And basically a lot of his life is being poured into that. And he's, and he's get the opportunity now to give you two paragraphs of his life's work in this one dictionary, right? And so then you have dozens and dozens and dozens of guys and girls who have spent that time in their scholarship trying to put together one dictionary for us. Just the wealth of time and energy and um, scholarship that's gone into something like this is huge. It's enormous. And then something like this, which I find very, very helpful as well, because it's a little bit more, I guess, towards the popular side of things, called the Bible Background Commentary of the New Testament. There's an Old Testament one as well, which I have. And this is, a, is an interesting commentary. If any of you are familiar with how commentaries work, as I said, they typically work through verse by verse of the, uh, of the passage that you're dealing with. And so when you pick up, say, commentary on Philippians, it will deal with verse by verse by verse by verse. And this commentary works in a very similar way, but instead of giving you more of the theology, it gives you the history of the day. So if you're doing the Sermon on the Mount, there will be articles written on the background, the Bible background history of what Jesus was talking about as he was talking to the Sermon on the Mount. And so it gives you much more of the historical context and the literary context, just kind of point blank. Um, it doesn't really comment on theology or application. It's just really this kind of commentary that's meant to help you understand context. Again, super helpful. Uh, so those are some background commentaries and, and dictionaries. Um, some that, are, I, that I don't think I put on your, your notes but are helpful as well, can be helpful as well. Um, different lexicons. This would fall in the category dictionaries too. Uh, this is kind of a Greek-English lexicon. So again, if you kind of have, have at least a little bit of original language understanding and you know what a word might be in the original language, you can kind of look it up and this kind of lexicon to try to find some scholar, again, has spent his whole life trying to define and help us define certain Greek words so that we can put it into English and put it into our language. And this is essentially what this is all about. It's a massive book. Of course, it's not something that you just sit around reading in your spare time. But if you're doing some really in-depth word studies and you're maybe studying a commentary, and that commentary uses the word um, agora a lot, well, what is that? Okay, well, he defined it as this, but, but, but what, what else or how else could it be known? You go into something like this and try to get an even bigger picture of what that word means, right? And then there's this, your classic trusty accord, uh, concordance. A concordance essentially helps you cross-reference and see where different words and phrases exist throughout the Bible. So again, if Jesus uses the word salt and light, well, where else? In the Bible, does the word salt and light come up? You could look those words up in the concordance and they would point you and direct you different places in the Word of God. 
Uh, so it can be very helpful. This one is one of the most popular ones, Strong's uh, Concordance. Um, I, don't, I didn't show you this one. This is a good one too. Jewish backgrounds of the New Testament. Um, it's, a, it's a smaller one, one that you could just sit around reading actually. Um, this deals with a lot of the history in the intertestamental period um, of, of uh, Palestine and, and uh, Israel. So we kind of know our history maybe a little bit up until the book of Malachi, and then we kind of know what's going on from Matthew onwards. But what about that span of a uh, number of, you know, 400 or so years in between Malachi and Matthew? What was going on then? Which let, you know, we, we don't read about the Pharisees or the Sadducees in the Old Testament, but then all of a sudden in the New Testament, there are these different groups of religious leaders. Where did they all come from? Jewish background commentary helps uh, understand kind of where that stuff originated from and uh, where they popped up from and what led to their arrival. Again, these are tools. I'm not saying that to be a good Bible interpreter, you've got to have all of those scholarly things in your back pocket or else you're not going to know the Word of God well. I'm not saying that at all, but those can be tools. And if you, depending on the depth you want to go and the curiosity you have as you're studying the Word of God, those tools uh, can be there to, um, to provide a lot of help. Uh, at the very least, I would suggest, if you're just kind of getting your feet wet with that kind of research, just some, a good quality commentary. Um, if you're studying through a book of the Bible, even your own personal time, and you would like some advice on a good commentary, please feel free to talk to me about that anytime. And, and some of you have uh, made that a habit in your own life of talking to me about commentaries. And believe me when I say, if you ask me, hey, Pastor, I'm studying the book of Philippians. What would be a good commentary? Be happy to be able to put something in your hand or, or point you in the right direction. Um, so th that's some of the tools. Um, but honestly, the reality is in my own personal study, I rarely crack open the actual hard copy of something nowadays because you can now get virtually everything you could ever want and more electronically through Bible software. And Bible software comes in all shapes and sizes as well. Um, there's online kind of Bible software and websites. Some of them I included there in your, um, your notes. Blue Letter Bible was one I used a lot in Bible school before I had Bible software. Blue Letter Bible has a lot of free commentaries uh, or public domain commentaries, uh, ones that are legal for anyone to look into because they're not copywritten anymore. The Blue Letter Bible is really good for that. Good at taking and showing you different translations all side by side, like interlinear. Um, what is a side by side one, Andrew? What's that called? Parallel. Yeah, some parallel study Bibles as well with Blue Letter Bible. Bible Gateway is another one as well. Again, if you maybe don't feel the need to put forth, you know, three, four hundred dollars into a Bible software. Um, Bible Gateway and Blue Letter Bible can be some really good alternatives um, to getting some of that good research stuff in there. The Bible Gateway is a little bit more polished than Blue Letter Bible, but honestly, Blue Letter Bible has a little bit more resources there if you dig into it. So it just kind of depends what you like. If you like the shiny product more than Bible Gateway, if you want to get some more value though out of the research, Blue Letter Bible is the one to go to. It's just a little bit more hard to navigate. It's a little bit trickier. Um, but then there are some full-blown um, Bible softwares that you download and actually have on your devices. Um, one kind of that isn't quite a, a Bible software per se, but I'll just mention it because I have it there in your notes and I think it's handy, is uh, the Bible Project. I've kind of sung their praises quite a bit over the last few years, as some of you know. Bible Project, you can see them online. They have their own website. And they, they, they have literally hours and hours and hours of video, com, like video commentary on every single book of the Bible. And beyond that, they also have video on um, different themes and theology in the Bible. The so Bible Project, I think it might be BibleProject.org. Honestly, I usually just go to their YouTube page, though, rather than their actual website. Uh, but the, all of those videos are free. And you can see them on you can see them online on YouTube. And if you go to their if if you go to their website, the Bible Project website, and you make an account with them, you can make a free account. You can literally download any of their videos to your mobile devices or anything like that. And you can download charts 
and pictures, images, all of the good visuals that they have that go along with it. So while it's not strictly speaking a Bible software, it still is a really good website that has some really good scholarship that's super helpful, I would feel, for, um, for again, a wide range of academics. And then they also have the Read Scripture app, which is my go-to app for doing my daily Bible readings. And they also have little videos embedded into those readings as well to be helpful. So I would put that one forth as well as a, as a handy software to study the Bible, read the Bible. Uh, but then the two kind of flagship Bible softwares that you can really get into if you want to get into them are Logos Bible Software and Accordance Bible Software. Logos is by far the more popular. Accordance is less popular primarily because they don't have the... Um, the funds behind them and because they're just predominantly only Macintosh platform, whereas Logos does kind of both. Logos used to be only Windows, but then they kind of made the jump into both worlds and they were much more successful at making that jump than Accordance was. And so Accordance has kind of just stuck with Macintosh um, platform. And so I have Accordance as well because I, I really like that platform. I really appreciate how well it works with my computers, my MacBook, my MacBook Air here in particular. And since I, I have a Mac in my office, I have a Mac as my laptop, and then I have an iPhone as well. That software works across all of those devices, and anything I do in one place, it's there in the other place. Any notes or anything I make, any work I do in one computer is, is right there for if I open up my phone, I can see literally all of my software, all of my commentaries, all of the Bible translations, they're here on my computer, but I also have them right in my, my pocket as well. So I could literally look up what words are in the Greek and the Hebrew and find some scholarly um, definition of them, even if I was just out hanging out with some buddies. I could just pull that out, have a theological discussion or debate. It's actually kind of helpful because it kind of, it lays to rest some of those opinions that can kind of just fly. If any of you know my brothers, a lot of times you get talking and someone just states what they believe is a fact. And then you just have, you know, your whole Bible software right there to say, wait a minute, this is what it really means. <laughs> and then uh, usually ends the debate. Right, Caleb? Okay. So Accordance is one that I like to use. And so I put it up on the screen there to try to give you a quick run through of what Bible software can do and what it looks like if you've never seen it before. Or maybe if you know about it, but you've just been a little bit too intimidated to kind of take the jump into it, I'll give you a quick little demo of what it can do, and maybe that will turn the tide and even make you want to get something like that. I'll do that because then I think it's at least a little bit more viewable. Um, I'm going to be in somebody's way, aren't I, no matter where I go. Maybe I'll go over here. I know I'll be out of the video shot, but that's okay because I think I'm just going to put the recording up on screen anyway. Um, but this is essentially what the Bible software kind of looks like. Um, I don't usually fill the whole screen like that when I'm doing it, of course, because uh, I kind of have, I'll have my notes up as well when I'm, I'm taking notes on uh, for the, for the sermons and that kind of stuff. But let me just kind of give you the example of the Book of Ruth. So what I would do if I was studying the Book of Ruth up in the up in the bar, I would just type in Ruth chapter one. It would take me to Ruth. And the, the entire English text is right there before me, which is super helpful. But I, I almost never just have the English text up. So almost always I'm going to have up beside it either a commentary or the original language. And the original language is helpful for me because I've done some studying in it. Um, so I might pull that up if I'm, if I'm going through for the first time. So over there I have some of my other study tools that I use recently or I use quite often, and so I can add them in parallel. So what I'll do is just pull up the Hebrew Bible right off the kick, and um, go the other way. There we go. I'm going to make the font a bit bigger so it's... And so uh, the cool thing about having them in parallel is I can kind of link them together so that when I scroll through, if I'm reading, when I go to verse 2, the, uh, the Hebrew is going to kind of follow along with me as I go. It's going to kind of keep itself in line with me. Um, if, I, if I don't really want to be looking at the Greek, or sorry, the Hebrew, I can get rid of that window and pop up one of my favorite commentaries, which happens to be 
the New International Commentary of the Old Testament. And so when I pull that one up, and the uh, font's super little, but I can make it kind of big. And so then the commentary, again, follows right along with the, uh, the verses that I have, because I have them linked together. And so as I work through um, Ruth, the commentary is going to follow right along with me, and the commentary itself I'm going to use. So you can see this is one of the more scholarly commentaries, and so as you read through this kind of commentary, you're going to come across Hebrew words that if you're not familiar with Hebrew, it's going to be a little tricky, but the author will oftentimes, oftentimes help define them as you go. One of the other commentaries I use a lot, which I feel is super helpful, for me anyway, is uh, the Tyndale commentary. If I could pull up in reference tools, my other commentaries. I have Tyndale here. Let me get rid of Nikot. Again, it's, um, it automatically is linked, so as I work through, each verse is going to kind of pop up as I go. I know it's the font small there, but that says Tyndale Commentary, and over here it has the ESV with Strong's Concordance attached. That's other information that's not quite necessary for this particular demo. But this is typically what I'll do as I'm, as I'm studying for anything, even if it's Sunday, for you know, the, the Sunday sermon. I'll pull up the text that I'm going to be preaching on, um, or studying for whatever, and I'll have commentary right up next to it and kind of working through. Now the cool thing about this particular Bible software is it has what's called instant details in a window down below, and so I'll, I'll kind of make that a little bit bigger. But if I hover over a word like Elimelech, Elimelech down in the bottom, you see that window where it has instant details, it's going to show me the Greek word. Um, that can be helpful. Sometimes it's not as helpful as you want. The word Bethlehem comes up in, Greek, in Hebrew. If I were in the New Testament, it would show up in, uh, in the Greek, of course. So those instant details can be helpful. There's a little bit more to the Greek, and so there's a little bit more scholarship there. There's a little bit more information for a New Testament uh, passage. Um, but typically what I do is that I would work through in the English, and I work through the commentary alongside it. And almost certainly, if I'm studying through for a sermon... Um, I would I would want I'd want the Hebrew Bible up maybe have them all up at the same time even and and I find that helpful particularly when going through the commentary because if the commentary guy is talking about some Hebrew words oftentimes I'll kind of go and I'll hover over the Hebrew word that I want to see and so for instance there was a famine in the land where the Hebrew word is this word rav. So it, it just literally means, down in the bottom there, I have a definition, just means it's, it means hunger. And so um, that might be interesting, but that's not a lot of information. So with most Bible softwares like Accordance, you can do things like double-click words. If I double-click that word, Rayav, it will bring up the, um, one of the biggest scholarly dictionaries in the Hebrew Bible that's ever been created, uh, called BDB. And the BDB dictionary gives you a much more exhaustive look at that particular word and all its different forms. Again, if that's the kind of depth that you want to get into, that can be helpful. Or else, um, if you're not interested in that kind of depth and you just want something simpler, then your commentaries can be super helpful. Um, Andrew brought his... Uh, parallel Bible the other week, it had like, does it have eight? It has eight different translations side by side. So I, I only have, I think, four or five English ones purchased with my Bible software, but so I could pull up um, a King James Version beside it if I wanted. I could pull up the NIV beside it. Again, it's kind of helpful because, again, as I go, it's going to be linked, so it's going to keep working itself along. Again, it's, it's a tool. It's something where virtually all of your resources are in one spot. And so all of the stuff that you see on my shelves in my office, a lot of that stuff is just for show now. Now, some of the more expensive stuff, like, like that theological word book, which could cost around $1,000 for the entire set, 
Some of them I still will, will use because I don't want to have to spend a thousand dollars in my Bible software all over again. So I'll kind of keep those a little bit, some of those gems, I'll still kind of go back to them, of course. Um, but the vast majority, I would say 90% of all of my research that I do for Bible studies, the sermon prep, it's all right there on my computer. It is literally right there. Now I can cross-reference things. Um, I can pull up commentaries side by side. But the other main thing that I think most people find Bible software the most useful for is not just pulling resources up to see things side by side. That's super helpful. But I would say probably the most helpful thing about a Bible software is the search ability. Something you cannot do, at least not nearly as quickly, with a hard copy of something. If I gave you even one of the dictionaries over there and said, look up the word agape, the word for love in Greek, you would have to spend time flipping through pages. Even if you knew the Greek word and you knew where it was located in the alphabet and in the dictionary, it would still take you some time. Whereas in my search bar at the top, I can literally write in the word love, for example, and it's going to show me every instance in the English language that love appears. If I had the Greek Bible open, I could type in the word agape, and it would show me every single time agape appears. If I opened up one of my dictionaries, I would type in the word agape, and it would show me the, the dictionary inputs, the dictionary reference of it immediately. And so the searchability of Bible software is pretty much the most valuable thing about Bible software. There was a day when pastors and theologians or Bible students they would want to study how a particular word was being used in the Bible. You know, if Jesus used salt and light, well, I think I know what salt and light means, but I want to see how other Bible authors, how other books of the Bible use the word salt and light. That'll help me understand Jesus a little bit better. You would have to meticulously go to a concordance um, or other dictionaries to find these cross-references or hope the commentary that you're studying provides you with everything you want but oftentimes they're only going to provide a fraction of the information. So what you can do is you can type in a word like love or light or salt and you can literally see. So I know the, the font's too small to see, but the word love in, this, in the ESV Bible appears 505 times in that form. 505 times. It appears 666 times in other forms, like love, loved, loves. So I can instantly see that detail. It's just literally a click, and I can see every time. And I, then I can work through from Genesis through Revelation and see the different places. Now, the other thing I can do, which is a little bit more advanced, maybe not necessarily something every Bible student's going to do, but one of the things I like to do with my Bible software is I like to type in multiple advanced searches at the same time. So I'll, let's say I'll type in the word love and God. Instead of the flex, I'll just do words. So now this is going to show me where the word love and God appears side by side in the entire Bible. In the, in the, in the, in the ESV, the word love and God appears side by side like that in three different verses for a total of four times. And so, again, you might think, well, why is that helpful? Well, if I wanted to find where God is paired with the word love, to see maybe how the characteristic of love is tied to God, that could be a helpful kind of search. But again, before the advent of Bible software, you would have to do that kind of study very, very meticulously. And you would have to know where those words existed, or you'd have to trust other commentaries. But now that we have this kind of these kinds of search engines, you can very, very quickly search things. And I know right at the top, that kind of seems boring and lame, and well, what's so exciting about that? But when you, when you get into studying the Bible for yourself, or even preparing lessons for other people, if you're becoming a Bible teacher or preaching the Word of God, there are going to, be, there are going to come times when you find very important words in the passage of Scripture that you're going to be teaching people and yes, you're going to rely on commentaries and dictionaries to help you understand that word. But one of the most valuable things you can do to understand words and phrases and ideas in the Bible is find where else they're used in the Bible. Very hard to do with just hard copies. 
But again, with the advent of Bible software and electronic forms, you can search those links, those cross-references, and immediately find information about how the Bible uses certain ideas and words. So I know it doesn't sound exciting. It is not the most glamorous way to study the Bible, but it is one of the most powerful tools for finding out what the Bible says about itself and therefore interpreting the Bible. There's a phrase that maybe you've heard some pastors or theologians use. It's, the, you know, you, you ought to use the Bible to help interpret the Bible. The Bible interprets itself. Now, that's not meant to be in a vacuum because there's lots of other ways and tools that can be useful in interpreting the Bible. But um, having the Bible interpret itself is also a very important way of, of understanding it. And so being able to search quickly and find information like that quickly can be very, very helpful. Not to mention the fact that, you know, you, you, over time you start to develop a library and you start to be able to have all of these different tools, all these different um, resources. Um, in my library, I have a couple, a couple, hundred, a couple hundred different reference tools. Um, in, my so in my Bible software, they're all right there. Um, I can click on them and open them up, um, the drop of a hat. I can search them and find information in them quicker than I ever could by trying to open them up physically. Um, there is something to be said about working slow and being patient, but then there's also something to be said about there's just sometimes where working slowly is just completely unnecessary, like searching for a word. When you can have your Bible software immediately show you where those words exist, and then you can begin using your mind immediately into making connections on how that word is to be understood and interpreted by the rest of Scripture. In my mind, that's one of the most valuable things you could have in your hands. Not only can you do it from your laptop, you can do it from your phone because of the way phones are super powerful nowadays. Everything you see that I'm doing up on the screen there, I can do all of that right from my phone as well. And every single detail and every single uh, function is even available on my phone. That's a little bit about Bible software. Uh, I think I'm, I mean, unless there's something specific about the Bible software you want to know, I think I'm going to move to close our time. Is there any questions or thoughts about Bible software that maybe you'd like to know? Or even a practical question about accordance that maybe you'd like to know? It depends what platform you're using, Logos or Accordance. They all have their different packages and plans and things like this, right? Um, there are some very basic starter packages with co which come with a number of commentaries. You just kind of have to read through what they offer. Um, but to give you an idea, Accordance and Logos kind of have your basic like $100 or $200 starter package. But then they might have a slightly more academic one for $500. They have another one up maybe closer to $1,000. They even have some that are up in the two, three thousand dollar ranges, or even higher. And so, you kind of pay for what you get, right? Um, and so, if you wanted a lot of commentaries, you might have to put a little bit more money into it. Um, the package that I initially started with was about a five hundred dollar one, and that came with a lot of commentaries and Greek and Hebrew tools. So, a lot of those dictionaries and Greek Bibles and texts and Hebrew Bibles it all came with that package. Um, but then there are other things that I purchased independent of that because Accordance has their own uh, website library. And so you can go there and add tools and modules to your software down the road, right? So you're not just stuck with one thing. You can add stuff as you go. So for instance, the New International Commentaries, which are kind of the really, really scholarly ones. I didn't start with those ones, but they were kind of added on later as, as modules. The Tyndale one was one I bought as well. Um, I got it for a super good deal. So the entire... I don't know, there's about 30 or 35 volumes in the Tyndale commentary set. And I got it for about $200 electronically. And, and again, to kind of put that into real world, if I were to buy every single physical copy of the Tyndale commentary, it'd be closer to $1,000. And so sometimes you get really good deals with the electronic versions of things. Um, yeah, it can be helpful. Yep. Logos has, a, has a, I think, a free base package, as Accordance does as well. Logos is kind of moving towards a system as well that is kind of linked to an online cloud system too. So you can actually use, you can use it as a, not as a download, but as a, like a cloud system so that it's not actually on your, your device. So that can, be, that can be handy, given the fact that sometimes these downloads take a lot of time. 
Um, but yes, uh, check out Lagos if you need to. Um, Accordance, if you have, if you like the Mac system and you want something that's specifically geared towards that, a little bit more um, uh, native to that device. Any other questions? It, it more or less depends on what's useful. Like if I threw 10 screens up there, I've never, I don't know if I've tried to really max it out. I know what happens is they, they start to kind of, they start to kind of get uh, small. They always go that. No, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can move them around. I, I haven't done it in a while, so I'd have to kind of look because Sometimes when you, do, so hold on, let me double click this. Okay, I'm going to end it off there. If you have any more questions, because we're almost nine and I'll, I'll end it off. I know what we've discussed today, especially the second half, much more just information overload. And so I don't want, I know there's probably some tired eyes going on because of the kind of information we've been dealing with. Wait. Suffice it to say, through this second lesson tonight, um, you're able to kind of widen your view and perspective on what kind of tools are available to you and how they're used. And um, like I said, you know, it, it, it's not necessary that every single tool needs to be utilized, but I think if you are going to go deeper than just devotional study of God's Word, which is good too, if you're going to go deeper than devotional study, you're at some point going to want to get your hands on some of these tools to be helpful especially if you ever feel you're going to be teaching the Word of God in any way, shape, or form. These tools will become um, indispensable in many ways. So let's, um, let's bow in a word of prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you again for uh, your goodness to us. Uh, we pray that you would strengthen our minds to be able to digest and filter through the information that uh, we've been bombarded with tonight. And dear Lord, I know that there is a lot to your word and there have been a lot of good tools that your church has produced over many generations. And Father, uh, many, many, many of them are very, very good. But it can also be overwhelming to be um, kind of struck with just the, the vast majority of, of what they all do and how to use them in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would... Um, just direct us towards tools and, um, and Bible study helps that are going to be useful in our lives, that are ultimately going to help us uncover the truth of your word in a more clear way, in a, in a way that helps us to see you um, more truly, and in a way that would ultimately be helpful for us to share with other people. And so, Lord, I pray that you dismiss us now with your grace and with your blessing and Keep us safe as we go, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.